morning everyone we're going to start I think we're on channel zero please make sure you have a headset otherwise you won't be able to hear the the workshop so welcome everyone to a workshop 181 who is following me tracking the tracking trackers uh, here we are with the Council of Europe and the Internet Society I'm going to start by introducing our panelists we have a very great lineup of speakers so let me just take you through who they are. First of all, uh, second from your right is Kimmen, and Kimmen is a qualified lawyer and heads up IAB Europe's regulatory department. He also tries to make sense of what the EU produce, something he finds increasingly challenging. If the EU wants every European online, someone has to pay for the services people use, and Kimmen thinks that this will primarily be advertising. Then. Uh, over to my right, uh, we have Ron, uh, Rob Van Erg, a PhD student at Leiden University, dual PhD centre The Hague, digital cop, technologist with a knack for coming up with creative solutions to difficult problems. He represents the Article 29 Data Protection Working Party in the ongoing debate on Do Not Track. We also have Cornelia Cutter, who is sitting. Cornelia, she's coming back. Oh, she's coming back. Uh, Director of Regulatory Policy, Corporate Affairs, LCA, Microsoft, EMEA. And she's been working on basically any policy related to the internet from various perspectives and is still not cynical, or maybe not. We also have Wendy Seltzer, aka Anne Anonymous, is Policy Counsel at the World Wide Web Consortium. She splits her time among technology, law and policy in support of the open web. And then finally, we have Malavika Yaram from India, and she's wearing three hats, the day job hat of partner at her law firm, the civil society hat of a fellow with the Center for Internet and Society, and the academic hat of a PhD candidate. She has a particular interest in identity, which is handy considering she has at least three of her own. And this is her first IGF, so please be nice to her, even though she's a lawyer. Okay, I'll just hand over to Sophie. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, Sophie Guasny, I work for the Council of Europe. Uh, thank you for being here. I'd like to uh, uh, thank also the participants which, uh, are not, who are not in the room participating remotely. Uh, Seance dédicace, that's for Marie, she's uh, in France, so it's very early for her and she's waking up to watch all of you and, uh, and the intervention. So thank you for the remote participation too. Just before we get started, we're going to be co-moderating, Sophie and I, and we're going to start with a series of very uh, uh, short answer and question sessions, and then follow, uh, follow up with uh, an open discussion with everybody in the room. So I'm going to turn to Sophie for the first question. The first question will be a, a question that we are putting to each of our panelists, whereas some of the other questions you will see will be addressed to each one in particular. And so the first question that would be put to each of them is how would they define online tracking? Uh, we will start to my right with Cornelia, please. Thank you, Sophie um, and Christine. Cornelia, I just, it's a 30 seconds rule, so it's a very short do we response. Have, do we have the time there, somewhere? There's the timing there. Okay. She's the timekeeper. Okay. So, so I'd say most people would define tracking as following um, the user uh, over multiple websites, um, unrelated websites, in, in order to build a profile um, of, of that user quite simply and I do believe that you need to do uh, to, to make a distinction between first party tracking and third party tracking. Um, most people would feel more uncomfortable with third party tracking. Um, there might be use, useful uses for that. Um, I can stop here if you want to. Okay. Rob, please. Yes. Um. I actually got two definitions. Uh, the first shorter one would be 
as sticking unique numbers onto browsing activity, such that individual users surfing the web leave a distinct footprint, digital footprint. Uh, the more longer concept would be, uh, it consists of three stages. It's the collecting of data, it's a storing and enriching of data, and the third phase would be the application of that data, uh, which we would then uh, label as a profile. Thank you. Wendy, please. Uh, thanks. I think I'd say uh, tracking is uh, following a user, a collection and use of information in a way that would be uh, unexpected uh, or doesn't give the user feedback about uh, the information as it's being used. Kimon? Yeah, so I think um, that the term uh, tracking is a bit confusing. and. Uh, we, we see this also in the DNT debate, where uh, actually nobody wants to touch the definition of tracking. And uh, what actually companies are really trying to do is to understand what the potential interest of a user is and to uh, offer services and content that uh, hopefully are going to match those potential interests. makes user behavior visible um, and when you're, you're tracking and tracing across what someone is doing it actually makes their behavior visible to people whether or not they know that it's being done okay with that quick warm-up question and it was a very difficult one particularly in 30 seconds we're now going to ask Rob, and we're going to give him two minutes for this one, how can users be tracked online? Well, the, the core of tracking is uh, to make use of uh, unique identifiers, um, which you can tag uh, on, onto a specific user. It's like a little bit of a, a bumper sticker with a serial number, or uh, if I would call it a micro tag. The key in uh, labeling uh, uh, people using uh, the web is that you need to have matching identifiers in the data set um, that allow for uh, the individual identification across multiple sites and across time. So the re-identification based on matching identifiers is an important element uh, to a be able to build up a profile. Um, an example would be, for instance, a cookie <coughs> named RTB cookie with a value of XYZ um, th this could also be uh, uh, the same value XYZ in a different cookie under a different name, Sonar. And th you see these two types of cookies, for instance, in real-time bidding. Um, and to make sure that you understand, it's not, not just limited to cookie-based technologies. Uh, this can also be done in real-time, for instance, sticking that identifier in the URL. Also, um, fingerprinting is another way of extracting a, a unique identifier. Uh, the matching identifier that can be used for tracking might be the IP address or a hash of the IP address which makes it into a unique longer number or uh, the user agent or a combination of those. That's all passive fingerprinting. That's my short introduction to how things are done and to summarize uh, the DNA of tracking are the unique identifiers. Thank you. Um, a question for Cornelia now. Um, Cornelia, uh, Microsoft enabled uh, Do Not Track by default in Internet Explorer 10. Uh, could you tell us why? And uh, uh, is Microsoft honoring Do Not Track preferences uh, which are communicated by other browsers? Thank you. So, first of all, um, Microsoft, um, when the FTC um, had announced um, its its request to browser vendors to 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 step up on privacy. Microsoft had two different uh, tools: the tracking protection list, which is a self-enforceable mechanism to stop tracking, and included over the year the DNT header. When we were discussing our next version of IE i10 which comes along with windows 8 we were looking at how consumers what the consumer preferences are 
and we did our own survey uh, in, in Europe and in the United States where 75% of the users wanted Microsoft to turn on Do Not Track. And this is consistent with prior research of the Pew um, study, uh, which indicated that 68 of Internet users are not okay with targeted advertising because they don't like having their online behavior tracked or analyzed. This, this number is actually much higher when, in, when, when users are uh, concerned about children. Um, more, more than the 75%, up to 90% of parents do not want that their kids are tracked online. So the, the, the consequence of that was to, to do uh, the default uh, do not track on. So we were basically just following our consumers' expectations. Now, um, there's not, this is not yet enough to be done and therefore on how we respond to DNT on our advertising sites has to go along with the developments in, in the standard setting in the W3C. Uh, thank you, Cornelia. I'd like to go back to the, the things that Rob was talking about and turn to Wendy and ask her, so we asked Rob, how can users be tracked online? So now let's ask Wendy, how can users avoid or otherwise reduce their exposure to online tracking? Well, it's a difficult problem because as users browse, as Rob said, they're leaving lots of unique identifiers, some of them uh, in uh, cookies, some of them in the browser fingerprint. So users can try to block that. They can try to block access by the uh, third parties who are sending ads or uh, cookies uh, or uh, identifiers along with their browsing session uh, and use technical means to do that. Uh, but it's very difficult to, uh, for an end user to identify and respond to all of those, even with tools such as uh, Ghostery uh, or Request Policy, various browser plugins uh, that they can use. Uh, so another uh, layer of response uh, is to use policy. Um, at the, the Do Not Track header uh, is one mechanism that's being discussed in uh, W3C World Wide Web Consortium uh, Tracking Protection Working Group uh, as a way users could send a request to uh, websites uh, that they not be tracked. The DNT header uh, is a little one byte uh, header uh, that's w when set to on uh, specifies do not track. Uh, there are um, beyond that additional technical means that more sophisticated users can employ uh, tools such as Tor to uh, anonymize their browsing and uh, mask both IP address and some of the browser fingerprint uh, signatures. Uh, and and uh, all of these work together and uh, provide a range of options for users uh, who want to avoid uh, the tracking of their online activity. Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, Rob, if I may ask you more precisely uh, about the European Data Protection Community position uh, regarding online tracking. Well, that position is actually a very firm position. Uh, it's called do not collect. Um, obviously, there is a little bit of a more granularity uh, to that. And uh, the Article 29 Data Protection uh, uh, Working Party has come up with a couple of opinions that are very relevant in this uh, uh, topic. The first opinion is the opinion on consent and another opinion is the opinion which uh, deals with possible exemptions for, uh, for cookies. And uh, let me start with uh, that latter one um, because the way uh, the argument is presented in that opinion is, uh, is a search for uh, is there a lacmus test uh, to see whether a cookie is really necessary for the operation of a website and can therefore be exempted. And the first criteria is uh, that for the sole purpose of carrying out uh, the tr transmission between the browser and the server, uh, which is then a, a communication of an electronics communication network, that would be a reason to say, okay, for example, the IP address is really, really necessary, otherwise we cannot communicate uh, over the internet. Um, the second thing is criterion B, uh, which is it's strictly necessary 
in order for the provider of an information society service to, that has been explicitly requested by a user or subscriber of that service. And that means uh, we talk about categories like if you're on an uh, e-commerce website and want to make a purchase, then of course the shopping basket is a very important element. Also maybe a language preference is an important element. So we were trying to see where, how large is the room that is there within the um, uh, European Directive uh, framework in order to be exempted from explicit prior consent. Um, well, if we talk about consent, there are a few uh, uh, qualities that you need to take into account. The first thing is that it needs to be uh, freely given. Uh, the second thing is a consent needs to be very specific and it needs to be an informed decision of the user. When it comes to sensitive data, we heard earlier from Cornelia that when it's about tracking children online, of course, that, uh, um, uh, ex that consent needs to be very explicit. Um, if it comes to other uh, categories of data which are not sensitive, then uh, the, uh, in our opinions, the term of unambiguous, that needs to be clear what the consent is being uh, used for, uh, that's being given. So to summarize, uh, there are uh, two, at least two very relevant opinions from the Data Protection uh, uh, Working Party. The first one is on consent, and the second one is on the exempt uh, for cookies. Um, and they can all be found on the website. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Now, Chandra Watson from the FTC was unable to be with us today, so she sent forward some points that she wanted us to bring up at this workshop, and so I'm going to ask uh, Sophie if she would go through them now. Yes, so here are the elements that were provided to us. Um, as part of its policy work, the FTC uh, released its final privacy report uh, in March, which set forth best practices that companies could adopt to protect consumers' privacy. And the FTC report recommends that companies should first incorporate privacy protections into products as they are developed, uh, that is, privacy by design. Um, they should offer consumers simplified choices about how their data is collected and used. And finally, uh, provide more transparency to consumers. As part of the effort to provide simplified uh, consumer choice, the FTC encouraged industry to implement a universal one-stop choice mechanism for online behavioral tracking, uh, often referred to as do not track that would provide a simple and easy way for consumers to control the tracking of their online activities. In order to be effective, any do not track system should include five key principles. A do not track system should be implemented universally to cover all parties that would track consumers. The choice mechanism should be easy to find, easy to understand, and easy to use. Any choices offered should be persistent, and should not be overridden if, for example, consumers clear their cookies or update their browsers. A do not track system should be comprehensive, effective, and enforceable. It should opt consumers out of behavioral tracking through any means and not permit technical loopholes. Finally, an effective do not track system should go beyond simply opting consumers out of receiving targeted advertisement. It should opt them out of collection of behavioral data for all purposes other than those that would be consistent with the context of the interaction. We will now turn to Malavika. Malavika, please. What is the attitude regarding online tracking in India and other parts of uh, uh, Asia and the Pacific? Um, there hasn't been a lot of empirical work done in comparing attitudes to privacy, but one of the studies that was undertaken by um, researchers at Carnegie Mellon actually f compared data between uh, the US and India. And one of the really weird responses was that 79% of people in the U.S. were concerned about keeping computerized information secure and being worried about online tracking, whereas it was about 21% in India. And one of the responses that came out was, for example, a typical response in the U.S. would be, 
people being able to monitor my behavior and my opinions through my email and browsing habits, that really freaks me out. And the Indian, a typical Indian response was, no, I don't have any concerns. In fact, I think you should computerize absolutely everything and digitize everything. So I think in a country where you, you have a history of things being inefficient and you have corruption, anything that has the promise of technology or um, looks like it could make things more efficient is seen as being a good thing. And the privacy implications are, you know, sort of, it's, it's seen as collateral damage. It's not, it's not that important. So that, that's just by way of a general remark. But um, to be a little more specific, we don't have rules about uh, do not track or online tracking um, in particular, but what we do have is the government has been trying to track down on the, um, the way in which ISPs monitor behavior, and they've also come up with a really bizarre set of rules about monitoring cyber cafes. There seems to be this suspicion that all kinds of illegal activity happens whenever caffeine is consumed. You know, so there's this sense that, you know, who knows, anybody who's drinking too much coffee is clearly a terrorist, so we must monitor everything they do. And um, we've actually got guidelines and rules that look into what is allowed and um, th um, just, just to go into it, sorry. Um, the ministry's notified rules and they've got a very broad notion of what a cyber cafe is. It actually even includes any venue where the internet can be accessed, which could be a hotel, it could be an airline, um, it could be a business class lounge in an airport, anything that offers Wi-Fi. And um, these establishments are forbidden from allowing any user to access computer resources without identity being established. And they have to do that um, through actually providing a passport or other forms of identity documents. The establishment is supposed to keep it for a year. They're allowed to photograph the user to make sure that they can actually track their online behavior and connect it to their real world identity. And um, there's no law that actually curbs the kind of retention that you can have. And they have to actually keep a log of all the usage that's occurred. So it's, it's pretty terrifying. Thank you, Malavika. That was extremely interesting. And so now we've had some perspectives from the EU, the US, and India. I hope that later on in this uh, rich discussion we're going to have, we can get perspectives from other parts of the world. But now let's turn to Kimmon and ask him, what is the advertising industry's position on tracking? Y yeah, I think, I think we need to see things in a larger context. So. Our economy today is really at a step of a new industrial revolution to become a data-driven economy. So logically, more and more data is going to be processed. And uh, this is just an evolution. Um, that means also that we have an opportunity, or industry, companies, uh, everybody on the internet, to provide services that are much more user-focused. So uh, in a positive sense, it's great that now suddenly a service provider can really find out what I as a consumer want and not just make assumptions, spend loads of money into research and try to find it out. And the most important thing is that can be done in an anonymous manner. So tracking the way we see it is a method to better understand what products a user might want um, from an economical perspective uh, on the advertising side, the classic non-targeted advertising is just not bringing enough revenue um, because uh, the price is so low and um, it doesn't bring enough revenue for publishers to really fund high quality content so we all can enjoy um, uh, all the information we get um, in a democratic free media. So um, the tracking in OBA in our view is really privacy friendly tracking because it is anonymous and I think importantly it doesn't really require you to log in it doesn't really require you to give details now if you think about the alternative is I log into a website I have to provide a lot of personal data and actually the company uh, that will request that has an opportunity to get a lot of more data from me than just uh, the um, browsing 
uh, the browsing details. Uh, in order to address that, because I'm exactly getting a credit card, we also have uh, established a self-regulatory program that brings in transparency because we acknowledge that OBA might not be as obvious uh, to the surfer. Thank you, Kim. And we're now going to move to our sort of next section of the, of the workshop. So we looked at tracking in general. We're now going to move specifically into do not track. And I'll turn to Sophie. So, Wendy, please, um, what is the W3C uh, tracking protection working group trying to achieve? What are their next steps? And uh, uh, what lesson has the W3C learned from this working group? Uh, and if you can uh, also mention your role in the working group and maybe more widely what the working group is trying to do for the audience. Uh, th thanks. So uh, the, the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, is a uh, standards body, uh, voluntary consensus-based uh, organization um, developing standards for the open web platform. Uh, so we work to, to bring parties together from industry, from uh, academia, from user side, from uh, publishing side, from regulatory side together into a room to to build standards for uh, how the web should work and how it can continue to serve uh, the interests of all of those uh, using and building on the web. So the, tr the Tracking Protection Working Group in particular uh, is a group that we chartered to improve user privacy and user control uh, by defining mechanisms for expressing user preferences around web tracking uh, and for blocking or allowing web tracking elements. Uh, so that's uh, th the charter uh, set out for the group, um, which is uh, and it working to develop uh, a global, uh, multi-stakeholder, uh, voluntary standard by which users can uh, express their tracking preferences. More specifically, it's building uh, two documents right now, a, a tracking preferences expression document standardizing technically what a do not track header uh, would look like, uh, and then a compliance document to describe what uh, a web server uh, would do when it receives that indication of do not track preference. Uh, I'm uh, on the staff of W3C. I'm not specifically working uh, with the uh, with the do not tr track uh, tracking protection working group. Uh, so I'm uh, speaking there from uh, fr from general uh, experience with the group. Our since you've asked lots of questions in, in that bunch, I. Uh, it's, um, it, you may have been reading some of the accounts of heated discussions in the group. It's a challenging problem. There are uh, lots of different parties coming together, some of whom haven't participated in, in standards work of this kind before, uh, some of whom uh, think they have uh, very different interests. Um, and so uh, we are working to provide them a forum for, for discussion. Um, we believe that this kind of voluntary uh, standard can help to achieve a result that's uh, better for privacy and for advertising and for commerce and publishing, uh, bringing together uh, the, the varied interests. Um, I think um, in a in a future process, we might uh, realize that it takes longer to, to bring uh, different parties together and uh, it's complex. We're still far from uh, the end of the process, and uh, we still hope uh, that, that it will uh, achieve a successful outcome. Thank you very much, Wendy. And Cornelia, as we already asked you a little bit about Microsoft, uh, but I still, given that we've moved to this very specific topic, uh, and given that Microsoft is one of the browser vendors, it, would you like to provide a brief comment about the work in the Tracking Protection Working Group and Microsoft's uh, ob objectives there? Yes, um, surely. So, first of all, Microsoft is a member of the W3C. We are a, we are a frequent participant in, in, in the standard setting exercises of the W3C. Um, we have been welcoming and also initiating part of, of, of that specific standard because obviously this need 
some sort of agreement amongst many stakeholders. Uh, so we have been participating in that particular standard setting exercise, which at the beginning had actually three uh, threats, um, um, one on, on the tracking protection lists, the one and the two that uh, Randy mentioned. Um, the what what happened, and I think that is that is what uh, eventually the audience is not um, necessarily um, aware of is we have with our decision to to accommodate co consumer preferences and consumer expectations, we have certainly triggered um, a new a new way of thinking about that, and we do believe that this is a very healthy debate to have. We believe that there will be ways uh, to continue behavioral advertising, but it will be built on trust with the consumer because the advertising industry will have to um, gain that trust in a, in, a, in a more transparent discussion with the consumer. And so we do believe that we are fully in line with um, our customers' expectations. We do that because we believe that um, we can compete with our browser if we if we um, respond to the consumer expectations. And for those in the European Union who know the European Digital Rights Organization, I I would refer just to its latest newsletters, which was published yesterday, which has an article on do not track and just read their statements and what they think about. Um, uh, this debate, and I think they can speak best for themselves, so I don't necessarily want to want to repeat that, but I, I very much um, would like you to, 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 to go on their website and, and read what they have to say, too. Uh, thank you very much, Cornelia. Before we move to the next question, I just uh, talking to Kimmon yesterday, he pointed out to me that IAB Europe is not exactly the same as IAB, so this might be relevant to the next question that we're asking him. So, Sophie, let me hand it back. Yes, and uh, as the question will also refer to a, a very particular step in the developments in the field of Do Not Track, I would like to refer to the background papers that were, re that were prepared for that workshop that you can find online. You have two background papers that, re that detail the, those latest developments. And so now, Kimen, um, why does AAB uh, support the, the position of the Digital Advertising Alliance not to honor DNT preferences communicated by Internet? Explorer 10, and uh, widely, uh, if do not track preference expression becomes prevalent, how will the internet advertising industry, or the Europe position at least, uh, adapt? Yeah, I mean, so just to clarify that, so we are IB Europe, and DAA is the US body, so we have set up something comparable in Europe, and that's called uh, the EDAA, and we have set it up with other key trade associations and uh, it's slightly different uh, as EDA is not uh, a policy body in Europe. So let me just go back into the question about the IE10 communication and uh, I think uh, in the US we have seen a statement that um, says very clearly what um, they, uh, they think about it. But um, when I see the communications from Microsoft I understand they want to address privacy. I think this is not uh, a bad thing at all, and we actually support um, the user's right to determine their privacy. And um, I don't think, however, that Microsoft should take a decision on behalf of the user. Uh, and I am not sure it is a new paradigm shift here. I think it's actually pretty much old school. And we see that a lot in the data protection debate. It's really paternalistic approaches. It's making decisions for someone else. And uh, I think the internet has actually changed, and we need to overcome this old thinking. Uh, it's not good consumers that need to be protected from bad companies. We see that actually industry responds to also calls, and there are also companies that really act also on behalf of users. Um, importantly, um, DNT could also be a tool that is acting for the user. So the problem is today we're not really clear what it will be. 
So we're currently in the standardization process. Uh, in parts is, uh, I'd say, messy. I think it's a fair, fair assessment. Everybody would agree. Um, and the problem is really nobody's explaining today the DNT impl uh, implementations we see, what DNT really is about. All I can say as a lawyer is, it doesn't really fit into the European legal context, and that's a bit of a problem. So that's why we think uh, our self-regulatory approach on OBA is pretty good because it offers two key elements. It uh, delivers compliance and uh, enforcement for the users. Thank you, Kimmon. Now we're going to turn to Rob and ask Rob, why are you participating in the W3C Tracking Protection Working Group? I'm participating in two capacities. The first one is as an uh, invited expert, uh, and I do that in, uh, in, as a result of my research uh, at the University of Leiden. Uh, I'm interested in making privacy measurable, and I use graphs and visualizations um, to basically uh, distinguish what are the key elements that make tracking possible and, and which parties are involved with that and what business models are connected with that uh, information flows. Uh, the second capacity is that I'm representing the Article 29 Working uh, Party in this debate. And uh, since I'm not a lawyer but a technologist, I try to bridge the gap between technology and law. And, and one of my uh, goals there is to uh, break the myth uh, of uh, anonymity. Uh, we hear the term anonymous data quite a lot. And uh, we also hear the term trust a lot. Uh, I think it's important uh, to in the debate to realize that uh, uh, anonymous data does not really exist anymore uh, and in order to move on with the debate it makes at least in the EU uh, things a lot more easier if we can reuse the uh, uh, underpinning privacy principles uh, in the debate uh, and if you say uh, the data is not anonymous then uh, the data protection uh, principles do apply and then we have a totally different debate so out of those two capacities uh, that's what drives me to take part of the Tracking Protection Working Group. So you have had some uh, some responses and positions of our panelists, both on the on the wider uh, tracking online tracking uh, uh, situation that was setting the scene, and then more into detail about the DNT do not track policy. Um, now we would like to uh, to have reactions from from the audience about those two aspects, either general questions about tracking or more specifically the uh, the do not track uh, policy. If there are any questions, and also from our remote participants, if any, no. So the, 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 the room here, please. Yes. Thank you very much. My name is Wolfgang Benedek, University of Graz, Austria. I could not follow the argument of Kaiman, uh, who said this would be a kind of paternalistic approach and so on, what Microsoft is trying to do and others in the working group. In my view, the issue is about uh, the choice of the consumer, that the consumer is given the options uh, to, do, to have what it wants. And... Um, that the principles which have been mentioned earlier, uh, which need to be uh, taken into account. And I do not see how in your approach uh, this is uh, being done at all. Uh, my question would also be, uh, where, where are we with this uh, policy of uh, do not track in practice? Uh, for we have nobody here from Google. We have nobody here from, uh, let's say, uh, Facebook. But also I'm thinking about iTunes, for example. There has been a, 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 comp uh, a, a lawsuit uh, in Berlin against uh, iTunes uh, regarding Genius uh, because of their tracking mechanism. 
and uh, again certain clauses uh, of uh, the terms of service of Google. And so I'm wondering uh, how to deal uh, with what is happening in these fields. I mean, at another panel, uh, Google was saying we are not tracking, but uh, everybody knows that's not true. Thank you. Okay, uh, since that question was directed specifically at Kimmen, I'll give you an opportunity to respond. Yeah, yes, thank you. Yes, th and Cornelia as well. I, I think I might have been a bit misleading. So we are part of W3C. We are supporting the efforts of getting a meaningful standard. So we want that. Um, the point about Microsoft is only that Microsoft takes the decision to switch do not track on by default, whereas we say, well, you know, the user should have uh, the right to decide, as you say, have, have the choice. And um, the, the point I think you mentioned about uh, those companies and regardless of what they do, but I think it's a very, very key aspect, and that's what we're saying. If you actually diminish the opportunity to do OBA as it is largely done today, the consequence is that um, you're gonna, going to be forced into a contract where actually your choice is limited because the choice you have today we do not track and also the industry self-regulation is to say no I don't want that and we're trying also we have started efforts to make DNT interoperable with our self-regulatory solution the problem is we don't know yet how it's going to look like but we're looking at the options so we have made a commitment publicly to make DNT interoperable with our uh, online behavioral se uh, advertising self-regulatory solution Kanita, before you start, let me just ask, is there anyone else in the room from Google or another browser vendor? Please put up your hand. Okay, Cornelia. Um, as, I, as I explained at the very beginning, um, we have set um, do not track on because of the consumer expectations that is relevant. Um, to specify, uh, in IE10, in IE um, when you set up uh, the new browser, you are actually pointed to the express settings in which do not track is on by default, and it is clearly explained what it means, what it does, and what it doesn't do. But uh, you can also uh, easily go to the customized settings, and there you can then put it on or off so the consumer has clearly the choice and we have actually done this in a second step so we had first made the decision to to put do not track on by default as a setting and then we have integrated that as an additional step to give this user choice to consumers um, Generally, I think um, uh, Kimon made the statement, uh, t two statements I would like to just quickly refer to. One is uh, the online behavioral advertising uh, self-regulation to which we are part of and we, we, we do believe in that system. We do believe that Do Not Track is an additional self-regulatory system which brings additional uh, consumer options as Wendy was referring to. We have different other tools that we allow users and um, on top of all of that, I think we shouldn't forget that the draft privacy regulation uh, is currently discussed at the European uh, Union. So there will, this is all a little bit in, in, in a fluid situation. So we, we need that discussion here to happen. Um, if we can have the microphone at the end, yeah. Robin, at the back of the room. Thank you. Um, is the microphone on? Is that okay? Okay. Um, you know, uh, with great respect, Kimon, if you hadn't told us you were a lawyer, I think we would have guessed by now. <laughs> um, the, the point I'd like to make, well, so any setting has to have a default, and it's either going to be on or off, and you can't, you can't have a setting that doesn't have a default position to start with. It's like having a light switch that isn't either on or off when you walk up to it. Um, but I, I'd like to flip the question around and couch it slightly differently. Um, because I think this is also directly related to what Rob said about unambiguous consent. Um, it seems to me that um, if you receive an, in an, indi an indication of consent, 
and it's not unambiguous, you as a service provider have to make a decision one way or the other. And I think that applies both to um, the consent to cookies and to things like do not track. So Rob, I wondered if, if you could give us a little bit more of an idea of how a service provider should respond if they receive an indication of consent, but they have some reason to believe that it's not unambiguous. Thank you. Um, what's often left out of the debate is the purpose of the data that you're giving consent to. Um, so if a user uh, is not aware of what he is consenting to, if, for instance, if, if it would be a, a wild card for, okay, this cookie uh, um, is being placed and is then going to be used for a multitude of purposes, th th that's more a little bit of the problem. The best party to assess that would be on the service side. Um, a service provider might actually have multiple purposes um, for the use of that specific information and we see that reflected in the do not track standard as the permitted uses um, for example um, the, the data might be used for security purposes but may also be reused for marketing purposes or for uh, affiliate marketing or conversion marketing um, may also be used for future product development uh, can be used for uh, debugging or for testing um, so to elaborate a little bit more on your question, um, what becomes important is the element of uh, three, uh, that is, does the user have a choice in the limitation, the purpose limitation of what you're consenting uh, to? Um, and the second thing would be, okay, if I have given my consent, can I also withdraw that? So on the server side, of course, the, 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 the service provider is in the best place uh, to explain to the user uh, uh, very clearly and specifically upfront uh, what that data needs, uh, is going to be used for. And in terms of the debate, uh, where, where we're standing to the debate, and this also reflects a little bit more to the earlier question of uh, Mr. Benedict, um, where we stand in this debate is that it's not really clear uh, whether do not track will be a, a meaningful instrument in that the consent of the user can be automated. Uh, this adds to what Kimavon was uh, explaining earlier. More and more data will be available in the future. No, and nobody is waiting for um, dialogue boxes for every specific uh, cookie or maybe the use of a fingerprint to express consent to. So we're looking for some kind of automated mechanism and that reflects the intent of the user. And actually there is a, 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 an element within the uh, a directive, the e-privacy directive, Article 5.3, and it's called Recital 66, that says if the browser is capable in its settings to reflect the wishes of a user, then, that, the, then those settings can be used to automate uh, the, uh, the consent of the user. Uh, so. We're trying to, to, to basically help the service provider, and therefore it's also a multi-stakeholder process in assessing whether the consent that is needed from the user is specific enough and also relevant in time enough before that collection takes place. Can I m maybe just add one point here? Because I think it's, it's a good point. You are right that do not track today is on or off. That's correct. But yes, exactly. There is a discussion about three states. So it's not just on or off. We're also discussing the third state. And we are actually not, we're not asking for four. We're asking for three, on, off, or not set. And actually, I think this is how cookies are also done today, the cookies uh, settings. And um, that was what we had in mind when we were discussing article, uh, recital 66 Rob was referring to. We were not looking into potential future browser settings, but what already is uh, existing today. And the cookie setting allow you to say, uh, I want uh, all cookies, I want uh, no cookies, ask me every time, and you can define which cookies you want. So I think it's an established concept, and we should take that over in DNT. 
Alright, uh, can you hear me? Uh, my name is uh, Turki Jam'an from ICT Qatar. Uh, my question is, who should uh, do not track apply uh, to, like should it apply to first parties or third parties only? Like can Amazon track you even if you have do not track, if you are using only the service? That's an excellent question and I'll see who wants to take that one first. Um, can you, can you? Yeah, it's, it's one of my favorite questions because I think that shows that at least what we have in Europe and, um, you know, I don't know where you come from, that I think the, the, the privacy framework uh, has few key failures. And um, the one is that um, if I have do not, the, the current discussion also on do not track are only about third parties. So first parties are totally out of the scope. But this is exactly my point, right? So. Um, if you push too hard limitations on this current existing model on online behavioral advertising, what you will see is that you concentrate the business to the very few big platforms that have a B2C business model and that can easily get a consent. Because the reality is people consent to whatever. I mean, you know, let's be clear about that. So does that lead to more privacy? I, I, I seriously doubt because the alternative is to have more data about a user, uh, have uh, potentially longer retention times because you can ask the user whatever you want in a contract and most of the users are actually going to agree to that contract. So um, the model we currently have I think is more, much more privacy friendly. D does anyone want to reply to what Kim has said? Uh, Rob? Yeah, it's not a direct reply, uh, but it's more t directed to what your question is. In the EU, the difference between first and third party does not exist. Uh, of that's all due to the e-privacy directive. Also, the first parties are subject to uh, the tracking element. Um, we, we have uh, the data controller and the data processor model. So if Amazon would be present as a widget on a different website, um, that widget contractual relationship with the website owner could be done as a processor. If, uh, if it's done uh, not uh, part of that uh, team of the controller and the processor, then it's considered uh, an external party and it becomes a controller again, a first party by itself. Uh, so um, in Europe actually the debate is getting much more transparent and we don't have the, the, well, basically the artificial um, distinction between first and third parties. Uh, I have a question. Uh, this is Faisal Hassan, uh, Internet Society Ambassador from uh, Bangladesh. Uh, my question is related to the cybersecurity, and uh, as uh, you mentioned that uh, in India they track uh, users uh, using uh, cyber cafes by taking photos and uh, getting data like passport and that sort of information. And I think that's okay if the government can keep the data in a secure place, it doesn't get hijacked. But it's more dangerous if the government doesn't uh, let the user know that they are tracking the user and uh, they're using the data without telling the user that they're using the user data. So how to address this problem? Um, <coughs> the first thing I'd say is it's not the government retaining the data. The actual retention is being done by the cafes. So it's this completely you know, disintermediated architecture of all kinds of people having your data holding on to documents. And one of the weird side effects of this is that there's actually a huge gray market in identity. You can buy someone's identity with all the supporting documents for as little as 10 cents. So that's one of the side effects but um, one of the things that's being done to tackle this is there's a new uh, privacy law in the offing we're not sure when it will come through but the uh, government set up a committee to look into whether India needs a new privacy law um, a committee was set up under the chairmanship of a former chief justice and they submitted their report to the Indian government about two and a half weeks ago really comprehensive uh, report about 92 pages long um, not exactly bedside reading, but um, it's, uh, it, it goes into a lot of detail about setting out nine new privacy p principles that should apply. And there's a lot of information in there about the use of identifiers. Um, there is a fear that, um, especially with new e-governance schemes that will use 
single sign-ons and a unique identifier under the unique identity scheme, that this becomes even more of a danger, and they've actually gone into some detail about how that should be prevented. But we don't know what shape the actual law will take. Um, we do have some data protection clauses under the Information Technology Act, but it's unclear how those records um, will be protected because given that our data protection law, such as it is, exists under our Information Technology Act, it only covers online records. So to the extent that people maintain registers in hard copy, which is usually the case in tiny little cafes, it won't be covered by our data protection principles such as we have them now. So we, we have this weird disconnect where exactly the same content in a digitized form is protected to a higher standard than if it's offline. Um, so that's one of the things that the new law will hopefully remedy. If I, if I may just bring a compliment, because uh, it's true that in setting up this workshop we use the word tracking, which brings us um, more to the commercial side. Um, the Council of Europe in 2010 issued a recommendation, which is a non-binding instrument, on profiling. But we're tackling the same issues, but this recommendation applies uh, as much as to the private sector as to the public sector and precisely we, we had in mind the uh, creation of profiles by law enforcement authorities so I invite you to consult that text. Any mic? Uh, good morning. Um, I have a question and a comment. My name is uh, Pepe Huerta. I'm from Chile, from NGO Meta. We are currently discussing uh, personal data, uh, a personal data bill there. Just started uh, a couple of months ago. And one of the common questions there uh, and a problem is enforcement. You know, uh, whatever standard uh, we create or the UN create, uh, sorry, the European Union create on uh, this uh, type of issues, will suffer from a problem of uh, enforcement because uh, uh, it's logical that, I don't know, Google or Facebook or big companies will, comp will comply with uh, any standard, but most of the uh, real problems or the, the, um, uh, the, the, the real scams on data uh, are um, outside the, the establishment for saying just a word. So how do you... Uh, um, work out this uh, enforcement issue. Uh, also about, uh, um, th and this is just a comment, about, uh, about the standards uh, when d you said don't track as a off switch as the, uh, in, uh, on Internet Explorer or whatever other browser. That will make also uh, um, um, websites that use, for example, uh, session IDs, stores and, and cookies uh, and not function anymore. So. No, th that's a question, actually. Uh, it will work that way? How, how, how it, will, it will work? Thank you. Okay, so Rob, do you want to take this first? Yes. Uh, I would like to respond quickly, um, because I tried to explain that um, the uh, consent is not that limited and not that strict that, for instance, session cookies would not be able anymore. Because that way, if you're using a, a framework or a content management system, uh, for instance, the Microsoft uh, Active Server pages, um, often uh, this comes with a, a whole set of cookies that are actually needed to make the, the service work. So what becomes important is then more a guiding principle, um, which is the question whether the identifier is actually necessary from a user perspective to provide the content uh, that the user is going about to experience. And the boundaries of what is necessary, uh, you can see uh, in the debate, for instance, is analytics necessary? Is analytics done by the website itself necessary in such a way? Or is it, if it's outsourced, for, for instance, if you would look, uh, if you would use Google Analytics? Um, there are more uh, maybe necessary clauses, but uh, if you look carefully to the opinion that's been published by the Article 29 Working Party, we've seen that the consensus of what's strictly necessary is very, very limited. Yeah, and just to add on that, on specifically again, the, the um, do not track um, where, where the compliance is still under discussion. So how to respond to, to the header which is sent 
will have to also be um, agreed upon. And, and there are, as I said, we hope that this standard is soon coming to a conclusion, but it's not there yet. Um, and this comes, I, I just also wanted to go back to the first party and, and third party, and indeed the e-privacy directive in Europe doesn't make that distinction, but uh, do not track is also not a compliance mechanism to comply with the e-privacy directive. Uh, I think this is just an additional tool. Um, and in, in, in a way, there is a di difference to make uh, when you are the Herald Tribunes or any other newspaper. You have some reasons to understand what kind of, who is, who is, who is reading you. You need to know your reader space. So there is, the user would expect that to happen. So the user expectation is probably very relevant here. Um, while the, the problem with third party tracking is, is likely to be that the, the user is not aware, and that is why, why I referred earlier that this is a healthy be debate to have, and, and we, we, are, we are optimistic that there will be found solutions for, for how, how that system will evolve with more user awareness about what's going on uh, in, 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 the form, in, in the form of, of uh, profiling and tracking, and what is good and what is not good for the consumer. I wanted to respond briefly as well to your uh, initial question around enforcement, uh, where there's a aspect that combines uh, technical interoperability and policy questions. Uh, the enforcement uh, comes partly from the, the interoperation uh, and partly from the, the environment. Uh, so uh, this isn't, it doesn't exist in isolation. It's against the background of regulatory climates in uh, the different jurisdictions where uh, parties operate. One of the aims uh, of the standardization process there uh, is to achieve something that's uh, as global uh, and as globally applicable as possible uh, so that uh, parties don't have to uh, change their technology in each country that they're operating or change their practices, uh, but they can, uh, to the extent possible, find uh, something that works consistently uh, across different jurisdictions um, or uh, recognize where they have to make different choices because uh, the laws of different countries vary. Thank you, Wendy. Kimmen? So the enforcement part is, I think, really important because there are so many companies out there and you need to somehow see where you're going to put your emphasis on. Now, we have set out self-regulation for online behavioral advertising. We have a compliance and enforcement regime. So the way we approach this is to say, no, we want to have clearly companies' commitment and they need to commit to it by signing this document. So already there you have an indication um, you know, this is going to be the good guys, and we have high coverage. We want to really have as uh, high as possible. We already have in many countries exceeded 8% coverage of the market. So um, that gives you an indication. You can then actually check which companies are part of it and which companies are not. I don't want to say that companies that are not part of it are going to be likely to be uh, bad companies, but, you know, it somehow gives you an indication uh, on, on, on where to look at. And also, self-regulation is a very strong incentive for the market to force actually companies to agree on a common standard. So I think there are merits to it. And self-regulation, I think, today is only working if you deliver also the compliance and enforcement element. That's, that's important, I think. Oh, where is the micro? Yeah, there was someone there. Thank you, Wolfgang Benedek again. Um, I'm convinced that self-regulation has its merits. It's indeed very important, uh, but it does not really help the consumer if it has a problem. So my question would be, what kind of remedies are being envisaged uh, for the user? Uh, I mean, there is a human right to remedy uh, when it comes uh, to violations of human rights. We are talking here about the human right to privacy. So I also have to have a right to remedy. And I ask myself, where are my rights uh, to remedy as a user uh, in that context when we are talking about enforcement? Thank you. Are 
Yeah. So I, th I think it's both in the U.S. and in, in Europe you have actually um, tools to do that. So under, under European law, if a company um, says or a company group says it adheres to a standard and it doesn't, then you, are, you can be held accountable under the Unfair Commercial Practice Directive, which is uh, according to national laws enforceable. It's fairly, so there is an enforcement mechanism which is possible. It actually includes in some countries, like in Austria, even consumer organizations have the, who have the ability to enforce that. So once you, and th this, is, this is basically something which, which you have, and, and I think I'm not a U.S. lawyer, so I don't know the U.S. law so well, but the FTC has similar rights when a company actually claims to be part of a standard. Uh, or code of conduct. And, and I mean, you know, you say it's nice what we did in self-regulation, and but what does it bring to the user? Actually, it <laughs> the entire point is of bringing it to the user to make these practices transparent, explain them what they are, and importantly, give them a complaint system. So when I speak about compliance and enforcement, it's all about setting up a complaint system. So there is a independent review whether the companies actually um, do what they have committed to do and if they don't there is a mechanism to um, sort of punish them it's going to hurt them and that's where we think is the strength whereas the DNT system as such doesn't really have uh, the teeth and we think a combination of both would be very strong uh. I'm Yoshiro Bato from um, Mobile Operator in Japan. Uh, I have a question, uh, especially from a mobile operator point of view. Uh, since uh, the you know the development of all the platforms uh, globally, that uh, of course the mobile operators have a very very big pressure to compete also in the platform business. So my question is uh, whether all these uh, uh, tracking uh, discussion. Uh, whether you have anything, uh, I mean, uh, or involved from the non-web uh, tracking systems like the mobile operators' systems tracking. Wendy. I'll, I'll start. I mean, the, the World Wide Web Consortium uh, operates primarily at the layer of web standards. We do have members who are uh, mobile operators, um, including some involved in the, the tracking protection work, uh, who are looking at uh, the web on mobile devices and the, the interaction uh, between network and uh, web usage. So, uh, well, that uh, some, some of those identifiers might uh, be, be considered specifically um, by participants there. Um, other times, uh, some of that work might happen at different layers, perhaps uh, at the IETF and uh, discussing protocols. Um, others um, in, uh, in industry associations among network operators. But certainly, any place it touches the web, um, th there are discussions uh, going on at W3C. OK, one more question, please. Uh, uh, Facebook officials have already said that uh, they have uh, they they uh, they hold the the biggest uh, behavior or compartmental database that have ever existed, and they are able and they are ready to to sell those information to to uh, to uh, to uh, clients, so to com companies. So, how do you think about this problem and how it is related to tracking? Thank you. Nabil, before I hand it over, could you just say your name and uh, Yes, I'm Nabil Benama from Morocco, and I'm ISOC ambassador this year to IGF. Thank you. Is it Kim and anyone else? It's, it's a very quick one. It's really a marketing issue. Don't believe half the stuff that you read, actually, about what companies know and do and, uh, you know, knowing about every citizen <laughs> on the planet, right? It's marketing. Uh, you know, if you believe 10%, it's in some cases already too much. <laughs> Can I just actually go back to, to, to the question and the Japanese, because I think it's a very, very important um, point uh, he raised. So, so I can tell you that um, 
we have a mobile operator that is looking into becoming part of our self-regulatory system. Um, beyond that, um, you might have seen or you can research that Telefonica in the UK has actually uh, rolled out a system called um, um, online behavior. Well, it's, it's a model, I think, where they offer the data to potential interested uh, advertising companies. Uh, it's called, I think, Smart Steps. And the, the Data Protection Authority in the UK has said, that's perfectly fine, good. Telefonica wanted to do that in Germany. And uh, there has been very strong reaction from the German government saying, no way, you're not going to do this in Germany because uh, there is special regulation in Germany on what um, mobile operators can and can't do actually with the data they have. And the German government's view is they're not able to do that. Yeah, the, the reason why I s ask the question specifically is because already in Japan there's one operator who is selling such data. Uh, all the GPS data and the user identification and the tracking, you know, the hi historical data for advertising uh, to third, uh, for the third parties to advertise to directly to the end user uh, or, uh, in various manners. Uh, and I think it's also a very complicated issue when it comes to mobile operator because when you roam, then you're in a different country, but you're still tracked because the roaming information will go back to the home country. So it's not only that as simple as, of course, a website sits where and the user is where. When because of the, uh, the nature of the mobile operating uh, system architecture, all the information goes back to the home country, and it's which is makes all these uh, lawful uh, uh, things more complicated. But Rob, maybe you can actually speak about your Dutch experience on this, I think. It's, n it's not about advertising, but it's pretty similar, I'd say. Yeah, I'm not going to address the Dutch uh, situation specifically, but I do want to bring into the debate that it's important to see that if the data is collected for one purpose, is making the mobile system work, that doesn't mean you can reuse that data for marketing or digital marketing uh, as such, uh, not in ev every uh, country. I know at least in the EU, and I, I also spoke to colleagues in Canada and the US. Um, it's very important to keep into mind that the proportionality of further use uh, needs to be taken into account. And if you're using technology in the mobile space, for instance, deep packet inspection, or if you're adding unique identifiers in the protocol, in the header, which could be in the GSM protocol, which is outside of the, um, basically of the, what the browser is able to do. It's, it's like the layer on top. Um, then it, it becomes a very intransparent way of tracking users and if the user is not a, 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 a even has any controls so if there's not even an opt-out and if there's no information on the website yeah then I, I would see that as something that that's problematic yeah. I, th I thought I saw there was a question at the back uh, have you changed your mind is there, is there any questions? Yes. Good morning. My name is Sande Richard. I'm from Tanzania. Uh, I will. I would like to ask about about the tracking that's been done on the on the mobile devices. At the moment, if you have like these smartphones, there are a lot of applications, and all these applications they are they are collecting a lot of information from people. I don't know if w <coughs> W3C, if they have any, any mechanism for enforcing or maybe any mechanism f to, to, to put a do not track on the, on the mobile, on the mobile de device so that it stop this small, small application that they are running like on the Android or on the, on the other iOS, uh, iOS system to stop tracking people. Th thanks for the question. Uh, again, we have in various working groups uh, considerations of the privacy uh, aspects, for example, of location tracking uh, or uh, some of the other sensors that a mobile device has uh, when it can communicates with web applications. Uh, so uh, there are groups building uh, device APIs that websites could communicate with when sending uh, 
pages to a mobile device and you might want to use the sensors to control the uh, navigation or give it uh, geographic information to do a, a targeted search or map. Uh, and those raise uh, clear privacy issues for which you want the API to have a means of, of getting user consent uh, before that information uh, is shared. Um, now, that, that doesn't apply uh, to uh, installed applications or other ways that the device might be able to uh, communicate. So one thing that, uh, that, that we can do uh, is to try to make the, the web platform uh, a place where users have uh, more control of their, their privacy experience, more choice about uh, how to disclose information through those uh, APIs, uh, and then uh, in, in other contexts, for example, in the United States, the Federal Trade Commission is looking at uh, privacy and mobile uh, experience uh, and looking at questions such as uh, are users giving consent or getting adequate notice uh, of the tracking that's possible on their uh, mobile devices. Um, and some of those things are, are questions that regulators in, in various contexts need to add, address as well. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of talk about empowerment of the users, and you mentioned also the principle of transparency. So when I saw the title of the workshop, Tracking the Trackers, I thought that maybe you will tell us also a bit about what can we do as a users to know who is tracking us? Uh, how can we be empowered, so to say, uh, to know more about in which situation we find ourselves uh, in order to get this transparency? So maybe there is something uh, we should still hear. Thank you. Um, I can tell you what we've done in India. We have, there is a really interesting little NGO called the Tactical Technology Collective. And they've created this wonderful project called Me and My Shadow. And one of the things they do is try to educate people about what is being done with their data, how they're being tracked. And it's across web and mobile. And they have what they call a shadow tracers kit. and it, it, it's very user friendly and um, it's funny, it's humorous, it's, it's, it's really interesting and they have a section where you can explore your traces so you can basically tick which kinds of devices you use and you know it will drill down into detail of all the kinds of information that might be collected about you and it gives you a whole set of tools so that you can check what is being collected and then there's another section called resize my shadow where you can actually take steps to minimize the tracking that takes place. And then there's another section called Turn the Tables, where you can actually track what they're tracking and know what they know. Um, and it, it literally gives you links to a whole bunch of applications that can block tracking and a whole bunch of ways in which you can actually fight back. And it, it sort of assumes that, you know, never mind the enforcement, the regulation, here's how you can take it into your own hands as a user. And it, I think it acknowledges one fundamental thing, which is that people would want privacy-friendly solutions if they didn't need a PhD in reading privacy policies to figure out how to configure their settings. And it, it actually demystifies a lot of the crazy stuff and makes it really easy to use. So that's just one example of a way in which an NGO has tackled it and made it user-friendly. If, if I can just make one compliment, because it's true, there is a variety of tools that exist uh, online uh, for you to know how you're tracked and uh, indeed to uh, to block it. Uh, and more and more, as it was said, the, the the same applies to the smartphone environments. And we see that some applications are now being developed that you can uh, install on your phone and which uh, which uh, do the same, which is to alert you on which data is being sent uh, to whom. Uh, from your smartphone, I know that Microsoft is uh, is working on on uh, on the project. Uh, I had one of the the projects uh, presented there, and uh, and how the application works. At the moment, I don't think it's uh, it's uh, available for for users. I think it, there's a think tank in Germany to working on that. So things are evolving, and and uh, more and more for the smartphone environment too. Uh, all those tools will be available. And just to follow up on what Sophie said, uh, a couple that I'd like to mention 
Uh, so if you want to look at what your browser fingerprint is, EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, produced this lovely tool which has a name that is difficult to pronounce, so excuse me if I get it wrong, Panopticlick. And then I also like to use uh, Collusion from time to time for Chrome or for the other browsers, which gives a nice illustration of what uh, entities are tracking you and how they're interrelated. They're just two examples. Just, just in addition, um, you can already, I mean, in already now in IE9, um, if you go to the uh, safety settings, privacy settings, and and you enable the personalized tracking protection list, there will be uh, popping up the the uh, general um, tracking uh, um, cookies that have that that have been installed in your in 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 your browser, so you can actually. You can actually enable that, and it would block them. So there's already tools able able to do that. And of course, I could not resist also mentioning your online choices .eu a website where we have set it up and where you can actually get information about online behavioral advertising, uh, and you can switch it off, and you can see all the companies that are actually active, and you can individually see what the status of each. Um, of their uh, cookies is effectively on your website on, or on your browser if, if they're installed. Uh, please, just one question to. No? We we'll just finish with a, a point on this. I want to add that uh, the web privacy measurement is actually a very active academic research field, and it turns out that determining in real time whether an identifier is possibly used for tracking is actually a very hard thing to do. So most of the instruments that have passed here on the table are, are set on uh, the principle that it, it, it's, it's rule-based. You, you already know before which party is doing what, uh, but that doesn't actually cover the whole scope of what is actually being done on the internet. You only catch, even with collusion, you only catch a small piece of the tracking that's actually happening. So the aspect of real time is important, and also to keep in mind that a lot of researchers are doing web crawls, they're visiting websites, not only just the front page, but also after logging in and going more deeper, to analyze what are the patterns of data uh, that um, are, be are created at that moment due to the behavior of surfing the web, and to um, distill the unique identifiers that are actually being used for, for tracking. And I think this is still a very, very early field, uh, and I hope um, that this will evolve in uh, real-time notifications, for instance, uh, a contextual indicator, or maybe something we have seen already in a geolocation sphere, where you have an arrow on a mobile phone, so you can see when you're actually using and sharing your accurate geolocation data with service providers. But that's a very challenging thing to do from an academic point of view. Uh, our f final question, I think. Yeah, just uh, brief. Uh, my question is to uh, Wendy. Uh, for uh, I would like to know uh, about. Uh, could you uh, give us uh, statistics about uh, uh, different browsers uh, and the respect uh, of uh, the tracking and DTN uh, uh, in in general? Be comparison between, for example, Chrome and uh, Firefox and others, how they are uh, respectful of uh, the principles of tracking, don't tracking in their uh, setup. Um, th thanks, I, I think I'm, the, the question um, is relating to sort of how browsers might implement the, the do not track feature, um, and that's something that is very much in flux right now because the the standard is currently under development, um, and so I don't have um, up to date um, details on how different browser vendors are working with this and uh, and implementing it. Um, I I do believe that uh, each of Chrome, Mozilla, um, Microsoft Internet Explorer. Uh, have an option in at least one version um, uh, of their browser, and I'm not yet sure about others. Uh, some of them may have beta versions or plugins uh, that you can use to to enable the do not track header. Thank you. 
I think I'm not sure. I think I understood the question differently. So your question was, if the browsers actually stop tracking, how they they are uh, setting up the, the the software to be able to uh, to uh, present to the user uh, the choice. Yes, the choice. Other ah, user interface. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Looking at our watch, uh, it's uh, it's now half past. Um, uh, I would like to thank the, the panelists for, first of all. Uh, it's been very informative. I think uh, we've learned a lot from you today. Uh, thank you very much to the audience too uh, uh, for putting uh, the questions uh, and hoping to see you uh, at another IGF event on the topic because as, you, as you've seen, uh, it's evolving. Things are not set. We're hoping further progress will be done uh, uh, on the topic. Um, I, I would like to, to, uh, to invite Christine to say a word too and thank you very much. Well, really Sophie said it all. Uh, on behalf of the Internet Society and the Council of Europe, we thank you everyone for participating in this workshop both in the room and watching remotely. We had an excellent uh, discussion and I hope that we can continue this in the coffee break. Thank you.